Olá, boa tarde. Bom, boa tarde a todos. Vamos dar início a mais uma conferência do ciclo de conferências do ISPA. Como vocês todos sabem, começou a semana passada. Excepcionalmente esta semana é à terça-feira e não à quinta. Para a semana voltarão a ter o horário normal das quintas-feiras ao meio-dia e meio. A conferência de hoje uh, vai ser preferida uh, pela professora Marian Bakerman. Uh, <laughs> That part is okay. <laughs> the one with the difficult name. In the, the, the one with the difficult name. Um, I'll do a, a little introduction in Portuguese and then I'll go on to the English one. Um, só para vos dizer que a professora Marian é uma das psicólogas mais conceituadas na área da psicologia do desenvolvimento. Uh, trabalha uh, dos efeitos das relações precoces na relação emocional, no conhecimento das emoções, na competência social e tudo e mais alguma coisa. Eu acho que nós passaríamos aqui o dia inteiro a referir a todos os trabalhos que já foram feitos pela professora. Foi das primeiras pessoas a fazer a ligação ou a demonstrar a importância também de, de nós fazermos os estudos com bases biológicas, nomeadamente a nível das oxitocinas, da parte genética e da parte neuronal também. Uh, e só para vos explicar também um pequeno detalhe, a professora Marian faz parte de, um, daqueles 1% dos psicólogos no mundo inteiro que são mais citados a nível mundial. Portanto, uh, só para dizer isto, percebem um bocadinho as implicações do trabalho que ela tem, uh, não só para a psicologia do desenvolvimento, mas para a psicologia em geral. Não é? uh, imaginem uh, pertencer ao 1% das pessoas que são mais conceituadas, mais reconhecidas, mais uh, referenciadas na literatura. E, portanto, o trabalho dela tem sido realmente uma inspiração para todos nós. E eu tenho a certeza absoluta que a conferência de hoje vai ser muito importante e também espero muito bem que também seja para vocês uma fonte de aprendizagem um, nos vossos, para a maior parte das pessoas que eu aqui estou a ver, uh, que estão a começar agora uh, as aulas no ISPA. Não é? Eu sei que tenho aqui uns alunos, felizmente, do nosso mestrado. Tenho os alunos de doutoramento, já desconheço as caras. Uh, tenho ali o grupo todo de desenvolvimento, mas a maior parte de vocês cálculo sejam alunos do primeiro ano e, portanto, é com muito prazer também que uh, eu vos agradeço por estarem aqui uh, e também de vos ver, que felizmente, infelizmente de vez em quando já dá saudades, mas pronto. Vou passar então agora a apresentar muito rapidamente a professora Marian, só dizer essencialmente obrigada, depois vou deixá-la falar e depois no fim vocês terão a oportunidade da conferência de fazerem as perguntas que entenderem que devem fazer, tá bem? So, Marion, I would like really to thank you very, very, very much for being here today. It's really a pleasure for me uh, and for all of us here in ISPA, uh, for all the group. Uh, you've been an inspiration for uh, all of us, uh, and I'm, I'm honest when I say that, uh, and your work has been really very important in the field and for us in, in particular. So thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you, Manuela. You normally I stand up, but then I'm in front of the screen, I think, so I'd better sit down. I'm very, very happy to be here, and thank you for organizing this and for being so welcoming. And I'm especially happy for, well, two reasons stand out. The first being that this is the first lecture that I do live again after almost two years. The last one was in December 2019 in Rome. And I think we all got tired of these Zoom meetings. So that's why I'm slightly overdressed. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this, is to, this is a great pleasure to, to be again live with an audience uh, to tell you something. The second reason is that, wow, Lisbon, it's a, such a beautiful city. And I, I, I would like to bring some of your blue sky with me to, to the Netherlands tomorrow. And, um, I have very fond memories of, uh, of Lisbon. Um, the last time, the only other time that I was in Lisbon was my honeymoon, <laughs> which is 30 years ago. <laughs> so, so I really thank you for this invitation. Um, 
It also means that I haven't given lectures for almost two years. So if it's a mess, that's the reason. <laughs> Please stop me if I go too fast or too slow. Let me know, uh, for I'm here for you. So it should not be that when I leave, you say, well, okay, we were an hour in a cool room, but nothing else happened. So please tell me if I go too fast or too slow or something is unclear. We're going to talk uh, today about parenting. It's in the heart, in the brain and in hormones. And I'm very happy to tell you something about our research of the past years, mostly the past 10 years, I think. If we think of dimensions of parenting, we think of hormones, brain and physiology that are underlying behavior. Or actually, we'll see later on in this lecture what, what would be the case. Would behavior be underlying for these physiological processes or would it be the other way around? We'll see. And we'll do so in relation to parent-child interaction, behavior, and in reaction to infant crying, infant cry sounds, a very uh, typical sound of, of babies. Now you all accepted that when I said parent-child interaction, this is the picture that I showed you. And most pictures show this, this, um, this mother-infant play. If you uh, look on a search machine such as Google, infant-parent interaction, this, this is what you see. But actually, half of the parents are fathers. And where are they in the research on parent-child interaction? So I'll try today also to pay attention to fathers more than is usually done in parenting research. Um, what we know from fathers in the literature is when we talk about the sensitivity in interaction with their infants, you find either no difference or if you find a difference, fathers are rated as less sensitive than mothers are. So their mean score, their average score is somewhat lower than that for mothers. Um, but you also see there's much overlap in the distributions, and I'm personally interested what makes that some fathers are low on sensitivity and some are high. Just like why are some mothers low on sensitivity and some mothers are high on sensitivity. What neurobiological processes might be involved in the variance in sensitivity in parent-infant interaction that we can observe? And if we talk about sensitivity and about the quality of uh, caregiving, a very useful paradigm is the uh, attachment theory, which is the, the shared work, uh, the common work of John Bowlby, who was more, more of a theoretist, a child psychiatrist, but he did more of the theoretical work. And Mary Ainsworth, who did more of the observational work in groups, more of the scientific work, you might say. And here you see immediately that it's not just a Western theory, for uh, Mary Ainsworth's primary work was done in Uganda. And what is uh, attachment? What is an attachment relationship? Well, in a secure attachment relationship, the child shows secure base behavior. That is, if he's distressed or ill or hungry or frightened, he seeks comfort from a caregiver who, if he or she is a sensitive caregiver, picks up the signal, responds to that soon, prompt, promptly, and then the child is reassured and can explore the world again. So the child strikes the balance between comfort seeking and exploring the world. So the child shows what we call secure base behavior, seek your parent when you need it, but explore the world when you're at ease. And the, child, the ideal parent responds to the child's signals with sensitive responsiveness. And that is also doing nothing when the child is playing. But when children are born, in little infants, they do not play for themselves, they cry. That's the thing that you get accustomed to the first six weeks is crying. And crying has a function. It elicits care and it brings the parents uh, closer to the infant, so it's proximity seeking. It's evolutionary adaptive, for a child would not survive without its parents. And it, give, it gives information on the health condition of the infants. And I'm go, going to let you hear some infant crying. This is the normal cry of a two-day-old infant. 
Now I'm also going to let you hear a different type of crying. How does that sound to you? It's heard? It's a bit more urgent? Exactly, very good. We manipulated this sound electronically so that it is on a higher pitch. But sick babies and babies with a neurological condition, they cry at a higher pitch. So crying at a higher pitch is informative on the baby's condition. Now, interestingly, depressed parents, parents with postnatal depression, have difficulties distinguishing these two types of crying. So that's very important in how they react or don't react to their infant's cry. Um, now, you sometimes hear from, from, from parents, from couples, well, my husband doesn't hear when the baby cries. <laughs> you recognize that? Okay. Uh, we tested it, and that's not true. <laughs> this is the heart rate response, the increase in heart rate in males and females when we expose them to bouts of infant crying. And you see that the males respond with increased heart rates as much as the females do. And for males without children, they respond even more. So it's not true that they don't hear the cry. What hormones and neural processes might be involved in the response to infant crying? And that's important because sensitive parenting is that when there is an infant signal, say crying or laughter, there must be awareness uh, according to the definition of Mary Ainsworth about what is sensitive responsiveness, the parent must be aware and perceive the signal, give a correct interpretation, and then a prompt and adequate reaction. So if a baby cries be because it's tired, a correct interpretation would not be that he's hungry or wants to play, and a prompt and adequate reaction would be to put the baby in bed and not intensify the playing with it. But for a prompt and adequate reaction, it's necessary to be aware of the crying and to have a good perception of that in the first place. So that's why brain responses to infant crying are of interest. And we did a meta-analysis that is combining all data from individual studies on parental responses to infant crying and see what makes a difference for, for instance, parents versus non-parents, for males versus females. And this is what we found. Parents activate much more brain regions in response to uh, listening to infant cry sounds. So something happens in the brain when uh, adults get children. And that's, of course, functional, for they have to do something with the crying infant. Males controlling for parenthood show more activation in the right IFG, the temporal pole, and the left <laughs> angular gyrus. Those are the brain regions that are involved in mentalizing and semantic processing. Whereas females, compared to uh, controlling for parenthood, compared to males, show more activation in the insula and somatosensory cortex. So they do more emotional processing. So that is a difference between males and females. And if you want to know more details about this study, here is the reference, the paper. Now, infant crying is so, it's a good thing for it. Uh, it gives proximity seeking, information on health condition, it's thus evolutionary adaptive, but it also elicits aversion. And by the time that infants are about six months of age, it's more than 6% of the parents who admit that they have shaken, slapped, or smothered the baby in order to stop the baby from crying. So it's also a risk. And we tested two groups of parents in their responses to infant cr crying, and these were both um, uh, parents that were uh, invited to, to take part in the research who visited a, a child uh, healthcare center, but half of them were maltreating mothers, both participating either in neglect or abuse, uh, and they were in family therapy, and the other half were non maltreating mothers, they were there because their child was in therapy for either ADHD or mm -hmm. dyslexia, but not family related, not parenting related. The families were very comparable on things like socioeconomic status or being married or not, 
or the number of children, but the maltreating mothers had experienced more childhood abuse themselves and reported to be more depressed and anxious. That was the only difference between the two groups. This was a study that we did together with Sophie Rijman as part of her PhD project some years ago. And what we did, we first measure their behavioral reaction to cry. And we did that using a hand grip anemometer that you may know if you visit um, fitness centers, you squeeze a hand grip anemometer. And what we did is we had them squeeze it at maximum strength and at half strength. And in the training phase, they could see on a monitor what was maximum strength so that it, they could train how much force they should use to squeeze at half strength. And once they could do that, we turned the screen away when they were able to modulate each second squeeze to half the strength of the first squeeze. We turned the monitor away and asked them again to do that in a baseline condition, during exposure to infant laughter and during listening to infant crying. And again, we asked them four times in each condition to squeeze at maximum strength and to squeeze at half strength. And you need that design because people differ in how, how much force they have in their, in their wrist. So you set your own baseline. And what we found was that the reactivity to infant crying and laughter was so that maltreating mothers more often used excessive force. They could not modulate their second squeeze as well as the other mothers did. And they did so both during laughter and during crying. And that was true for mothers who perpetrated physical abuse, but also for those who were neglectful. And the head grid anemometer is more often used in studies with maltreating uh, or at risk of maltreating parents. For if you can't modulate your hand grip force, uh, with the dynamometer, it's probable that you also cannot modulate your force in interaction, in interaction with your child. So it's, uh, uh, it's not really parenting behavior, but it's closely related. We also measure their physiological reactivity to infant crying. Uh, again, these bouts of infant crying, and we took a hormone from their saliva that is salivary alpha amylase, which is produced in the mouth and is an indirect, non-invasive measure for activity from the sympathetic nervous system, the immediate stress response. Cortisol is the most famous stress response, but you would see cortisol response only after 20 minutes. So then it would be confounded with all other things. Uh, salivary alpha amylase is a direct response, and that's why we took samples after listening to the crying sounds. And we found that the maltreating mothers showed a much flatter profile uh, from baseline to listening to bouts of infants crying, more flattened than the non-maltreating mothers. And also in terms of their skin conductance, which is a measure for arousal, they show a flatter profile than the non-maltreating mothers. And interestingly, uh, in relation to their heart rate, normally the heart rate and the pre-ejection period are negatively associated, as you see here in the non-maltreating mothers. But the maltreating mothers showed a totally different pattern. It was dysregulated. It was not the normal negative correlation that you would expect. So there's a dissociation of heart rate and pre-ejection period in maltreating mothers. Summarizing, so far, what did we learn? Infant crying elicits responses in heart rates, brain, skin conductance, and stress hormones. Infant crying is a risk for maltreatment. Maltreating parents show dysregulated physiological responses to infant crying. And we may wonder whether that may have to do something with their own attachment experiences or their own attachment representations if they had, as I said, experienced more childhood abuse in their own youth. So could a dysregulation be a result of their own experiences rather than a correlate of their current behavior? So that is why we also interview them with the adult attachment interview. What about adult attachment representations in maltreating uh, parents? 
And what is an adult attachment representation? It is a set of conscious and unconscious rules for the organization of information about attachment experiences and for obtaining or limited access to that information. That's the definition from Maine, Kaplan and Cassidy. So it is about how easy you have access to attachment relevant experiences and thoughts. And you can measure that with the adult attachment interview, which then gives you a attachment representation classification. The interview is a semi-structured interview where the interviewee is asked about general descriptors for childhood attachment relationship, both with the father and with the mother, and then for concrete evidence from attachment related experience. So if someone says, my mother was loving or my father was warm, the next question is, can you give an example of when your mother was loving or when your father was warm? So, give evidence. There are also questions uh, uh, on the evaluation of the effects of early experiences on the current personality. There are questions about traumatic events, loss and maltreatment, and on the current relationship with parents. And based on the pattern of answers to these questions, the interviews are classified uh, and the coherence, not the contents, but the coherence of the answers is most important. So that in the categories, secure autonomous or free adults, they value attachment relationships and they are able to back up the general descriptors that they have for their fathers and their mothers with concrete evidence. Insecure dismissing adults idealize or minimize the importance of attachment or they uh, say they don't remember much of early of their childhood and often they idealize their parents in that they say their parents were patient but they can't give a concrete example of patience happening in their childhood. Insecure preoccupied parents are still very much involved with attachment experiences, they are still angry on their parents or passively involved, they still do want to do everything as their parents want them to do. Uh, and apart from these main classifications, there's a, a category for unresolved loss and trauma that can be assigned in addition to the other three classifications. Uh, so it's important that you see that it's the coherence that signifies the, the secure adults. Okay, going back to the adult attachment representations in maltreating and non-maltreating mothers, we found that in the non-maltreating mothers, the majority were secure. Whereas in the maltreating mothers, the majority of the uh, interviews, PUEs, almost 50%, uh, one of the largest groups, uh, was actually unresolved. And that was very similar to the global distributions that we found when we meta-analytically combined all adult attachment interviews that had been done so far, that is uh, in 2009. There were 10,000 at the time. We are currently planning a, uh, a follow-up with 20,000 AIs that have been administered uh, by now. For typical mothers, the majority is secure. For Ap uh, mothers with uh, abuse or trauma experiences, the majority is unresolved. Oops, what, hap what happens here? Uh, this is not good at all. This is my whole presentation and it's not yet time. Wow. Well, now you know all my secrets. Stop this. And we'll go back to where we were. Uh, which was here. You forgot what you saw, didn't you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, in a different sample, not the sample of maltreating parents, but in a different sample, we tested the, the link between AI, attachment representation, and response, neural response to crying. And in this uh, example, we had women without children, we administered the AI, and we exposed them to infant cry sounds. The normal sound, which is 500 hertz, the somewhat higher sound that I, uh, that I exposed you to as well, 700 and even 900 hertz. But in an fMRI machine, you also need a control sound. 
a control sound to measure the difference in neural response to the cry sound and the control sound. So let's hear the control sound. <coughs> What we did to make this control sound is we cut the cry sound in thousand pieces and we reorder them randomly so that you have the same or matching or a, on acoustic characteristic, but it has not the emotional meaning of crying. It's more like a saw or something. It's not crying, but very similar in acoustic uh, characteristics. And what we found that the insecures had more activity in the amygdala region of the brain, which is related to anxiety, aversion, and arousal. And that was true for all three insecure categories, for dismissing, preoccupied, and unresolved adults. And when we did in this sample also the hand grip force, the hand grip dynamometer force, um, squeezing during control sounds and during uh, crying, we found that the insecures more often used excessive force compared to the secures. And they also reported that the cry sounds, they, they found that more irritating than the secures. So what did we learn so far? Maltreating parents are more often unresolved. Insecure parents show more activity of the amygdala in response to crying, indicating more aversion. And insecure parents experience more irritation during infant crying and use excessive force more often. So apparently it does matter what your representation of attachment is. Now we've had the brain, we've had a heart, time for hormones, hormones in parenting. In animals, parenting is under hormonal control. Uh, if you give them a, a blocker or uh, an antagonist, they will not show any parenting behavior. The sheep will send away her lamb, the rodents will kill their, their offspring. That's not true, fortunately, in humans. In humans, it's not hormone dependent, but hormones do play a role. And these are hormones that, uh, that do play a role, oxytocin, testosterone, cortisol, prolactin, estradiol, and vasopressin. And today I'll focus mostly on oxytocin and testosterone, but the others will sometimes be in the picture for a small part. Okay, oxytocin, the love hormone. It's a strong increase that uh, females have during parturation. Uh, the word Oxytocin is derived from the Greek oxys tokos, which means speedy birth, so it makes birth more speedy, more fast, and it also spikes during breastfeeding. And oxytocin experiments where we administered oxytocin showed that there is decreased arousal and aversion to infant crying after uh, administering oxytocin, an increased reward processing to infant laughter, the hand grip force in response to infants crying decreases after sniffing oxytocin and um, the sensitive structuring behavior of fathers increases after administration of oxytocin. So let's turn to the last one. In oxytocin increases paternal sensitive play. And these are actually two studies, two small studies. One uh, study of fathers with typical children and one study of fathers with uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder children and the children were around three years of age and they were um, uh, observed twice with an intervening period of one week and they got once an oxytocin sniff and once a placebo and it was double blind neither we nor they knew when they got one and the order was randomized and counterbalanced so that a similar number of fathers had first oxytocin as placebo. And what we found was that in the oxytocin condition, the fathers showed more sensitive structuring active play and they tended to show less hostility. Whereas the child response in, in, in both observations was similar. And that was very important to me for that meant that the Children did not change their behavior. It was purely on the parent's side, on the father's side. The children did not elicit different behavior from the parent. Now, this was a very small sample, so um, it was good that 
It was also found in our next sample, the fathers with ASD children, where we found basically the same results. So that was reassuring, for you all know about the replication crisis in psychology, so replication in the different samples, very, very, very important. Now there was another reason why this result was, in my perspective, so nice. Here it's the combined data from the two samples. Where, where we administered oxytocin and saw an increase in sensitive structuring active play from the fathers, there was a study in Israel from the lab of Ruth Feldman that showed that in a correlational study for mothers, when mothers showed much uh, affectionate contact in the interaction with their infants, they showed an increase in oxytocin, whereas for fathers, fathers showed this strongest increase in oxytocin, where they uh, showed especially much simulatory touch, so active play. So this is a nice diptych. Fathers who show more of this type of play show an increase in oxytocin. And if we experimentally increase the level of oxytocin, they show an increase of this type of play. So that is nicely complementary. And uh, I think that's that's as important as replication that it builds that you build uh, on the research of other labs and see whether in a experimental design you can uh, find results that fit with studies with a correlational design. Okay, oxytocin effects on brain response to infants crying. In the fMRI scanner, we uh, had the, the participants listen to cry sounds at the various pitches uh, with the cultural sounds that were also in various pitches. And this was our first study where we used the fMRI machine and we had the idea that we could not ask participants to, to enter the machine twice. We do so now, even three times, but at that moment we thought mm, that might be difficult. So. We had an example of twin siblings, female twin siblings, both monozygotic and dizygotic. So they were similar in age and um, some of them were even genetically uh, similar. And we assigned one to the placebo and one to the, con to the uh, oxytocin condition. And we found that oxytocin reduced amygdala activation to infant crying. We also found that oxytocin increased insula and inferior frontal gyrus activation to infants crying. So together with the reduced amygdala activation, that means that in the oxytocin condition, participants had activation in brain areas that were related to less anxiety and aversion and more empathy. Now, fortunately, after about six weeks, infants do not only cry, but they also smile. There's infant laughter, and that is so much nicer. <laughs> you can't stop yourself from <laughs> smiling if you hear this. And we wondered whether oxytocin would also affect the processing of infant laughter. And it did. It reduced, again, uh, the activity of the amygdala, so stress reduction, but it will also increase the connectivity between amygdala and the neural reward centers. So it increased the reward value of infant laughter, oxytocin. Isn't that wonderful as a young parent when you have more oxytocin that uh, the crying influence is somewhat dampened and the, you enjoy the more the uh, uh, the infant laughter. For that also increases the, the wish to interact with your baby. So is oxytocin a great therapeutic adjunctive? Is it mother's little helper? Should we order it now and distribute it on a wide scale? That would be great. Um, but unfortunately I'm afraid it doesn't work. For Oxytocin effects are moderated by childhood experiences. We had found that already in several of our own studies, the studies of our own lab, that there was variation in effects of oxytocin administration, and it was the participants with negative childhood experiences who did not benefit from oxytocin administration or in whom the effects were the smallest. So 
um, as we sometimes do in the Netherlands, we do a meta-analysis plan. Uh, so we, we collect all studies that did oxytocin administration or did something with oxytocin and we, um, we tested whether there was any influence of uh, adverse childhood experiences in the participants. And we did find that, so that when participants had more adverse childhood experiences, they had lower oxytocin levels, basal levels, both in children and in adults. They had more methylation of the oxytocin receptor gene, which is less gene expression of the oxytocin receptor gene, and fewer or no positive effects of oxytocin administration. And there's a table that you can't read, I realize. But you see for uh, participants with lower um, at first childhood, so more positive childhood experiences. There's a combined effect size uh, as a correlation of 0.12, that is a, a D, a coins D of 0.25, 26. Whereas for participants with more adverse childhood experiences, it is 0.01, so basically zero. So, if you want to read more about this meta-analysis, here is the paper. So, basically, it doesn't work for those who need it most. Why would that be that oxytocin does not work uh, when you've had uh, bad or untoward childhood experiences? Well, we think for two reasons. The first is, if you have adverse childhood experiences, that may not only influence your, uh, the absence or presence of a psychiatric disorder, but also your cognitive representation of the world. And oxytocin has as a function that parents tend and defend their offspring. So they tend for their offspring, but they also defend that from outsiders who may harm their child. In, uh, in rodents, for instance, um, on day six, when in, in, in marmosets, uh, on day, day six after giving birth to, to the young, to the offspring, to the pups, the oxytocin levels are the highest, but they are also the most aggressive when an unknown uh, 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 potential intruder is placed in the cage. So it's both tending but also defending. It's increasing trust to the in-group, but also increasing dis distrust to the out-group. And it could be that for uh, people with untoward childhood experiences, a much larger part of the, of the world is the outside world, and not the, the in-group, it's the out-group. And it increases aggression to the out-group. So that's why oxytocin might work differently. And the second reason B, and we tested that now uh, meta-analytically, in epigenetics, the uh, methylation of the oxytocin receptor gene means that there's less oxytocin recept receptor available, so oxytocin cannot bind to the oxytocin receptor. And oxytocin and vasopressin are very similar molecules and they can cross-bind. But oxytocin is relaxing, and phasopressing is alerting. So when oxytocin administered binds to phasopressin receptors that are more available when you have had a hard childhood, it does not relax you. It makes you more alert and a bit more aggressive. So that is why it won't work to administer uh, oxytocin as a standalone treatment for better parenting. So oxytocin seems to promote positive parenting, but it does not help those who may be most in need of support, unfortunately. So we as human uh, clinicians are necessary. It's not enough to order oxytocin. Next hormone, testosterone, mostly a male hormone, so fathers. And testosterone is best known from the perspective of mating versus parenting. And the challenge hypothesis is that T levels increase in males in context of competition, mating, seeking the best partner, and decrease in the context of caregiving. <laughs> so the one on the left hand would have higher levels of testosterone than the one on the right hand. 
um, we tested or we challenged this challenging this challenge hypothesis in a meta-analysis again that included more than seven thousand uh, um, fathers, uh, more than fifty studies. And we tested the association between oxy uh, testosterone levels and parental status, having children or not parent equality and testosterone reactivity to infant signals or to parenting related tasks. And we found effect sizes that were sometimes significant, sometimes not, but they are small. You see uh, hedges G, which is comparable to Cohen's D, the standardized difference between two groups, of around 0.20, which is a correlation of around 0.10, a small effect for parental status even smaller for parent equality, and around 0 0.20, 0 0.19 for reactivity. And what we see is that this, this is the <coughs> cumulative effect size, is that early studies had large effects, but you also see wide confidence intervals, and later studies with each study added, the effect is a bit smaller. And that's sometimes called the winner's curse. Early studies are very innovative and they do sometimes find large effects that cannot always be replicated in, um, in subsequent studies. Same is true for parental status, where for parental status something to note is also that there are few within subject studies. So often a group of parents is compared to a group of non-parents. Uh, but that's, that's, that's of course not the very best uh, comparison, for they may lead completely different lives. If, for instance, the non-parents play football uh, three times a week or do another competitive sport, that will give them high testosterone levels, whereas the, the, the fathers, even if they do not interact with their child, um, they may have a different rhythm. Or they may simply be older, for testosterone levels go down with increasing age. So there's no very strong support for the challenge hypothesis and explanations may be that testosterone is also needed for parents. Testosterone activates, which is necessary in response to infant signals. And testosterone is also linked via uh, estradiol to oxytocin. So it's one of the ingredients to make oxytocin. So it's good that it's not uh, uh, completely disappearing when men become fathers. Um, it's, there can be interaction with other hormones, and I'll come back to that. And there might be timing issues. How long before and after birth are the testosterone samples taken? And it may actually be related to behavior. It's not, do you have children or not? But how much do you do with your children? And Gettler found in one of his studies lower testosterone levels in fathers who interacted with to care of their ch children for more than three hours per day. So it doesn't matter perhaps who you are, whether you're a father or not, but it matters what you do. Let's have a look also uh, on interaction with other hormones, a somewhat closer look. And um, the first closer look that we'll take is on the interaction between testosterone and the stress hormone cortisol. And in a study of uh, Peter Boss in the Netherlands, uh, where they also observed prenatal parenting with an infant doll that cries that we also used in our studies to measure prenatal parenting, they found a decrease in parenting quality with increasing testosterone, especially for fathers with uh, uh, high cortisol levels. And in the postnatal phase, observed with their own babies, they found also a uh, an decrease of sensitivity in men with high testosterone uh, with increasing cortisol. So for males, high cortisol in combination with high testosterone is bad news. That's in some of the results. We found in our own studies that uh, testosterone interacted with estradiol and there was a decreasing in parenting quality with increasing testosterone for fathers with high estradiol. So hormones work in, in concert. For males, uh, in our study, high testosterone in combination with high estradiol, estradiol was bad news. By the way, it might be interesting to see how hormonal levels develop from 
before the birth of the first infant to after the birth of the first infant. There are uh, two very small studies that have uh, looked at prenatal levels in the past, but these are with 19 and 11 fathers. We observe them prenatally and postnatally in the sample of uh, 70 fathers, and we found that testosterone decreases from pre-birth to post-birth. Cortisol also decreases, so this is good news. Uh, estradiol was more or less stable. Oxy oxytocin increased a little bit and vasopressin uh, went down as well. So what did we learn so far? Testosterone is weakly related to parenting in men. Uh, it seems especially so in interaction with other hormones, and it may be associated with parenting involvement, with investment, how much do they do with their children. Now this transition from having no children to having children is, in my perspective, a very interesting period. And that's why I want to return a bit to the brain. What changes can be observed in the brain in the transition to parenthood? And this is a rather young field of research, so what you'll see is that the, the findings are not yet so stable. There's not so much replication so far. Between 3 and 14 weeks after birth, Kim and colleagues found that in men, in fathers, there was a gray matter increase in some regions, but also a decrease in some other regions. In a quite famous study of uh, Huxima, um, on a Spanish sample, uh, where she measured fathers and mothers from before pregnancy, so that's even earlier, to two years after giving birth. There was a change in gray matter volume in mothers, which was related to a uh, lower performance on working memory. Um, that's a pity. Uh, not in fathers, these structural changes. We compared expectant with new fathers, so during pregnancy and after the birth, and we found no difference in resting state functional connectivity. Uh, but we did find in the longitudinal study uh, from pregnancy to after birth increased reactivity to cry sounds. So there's much more alertness to cry sounds, as we also found in the meta analysis for the difference between parents and non parents. Now it may be good to give a second thought to how brain and behavior may be related. We tend to think that there's something in the brain that tells us how to behave with the child, as if there's a little homo nucleus in our brain which tells us what we should do. But it could actually be the other way around. What we do with children might affect our brains, just like dancers who are used to moving on music, the brains of dancers respond differently to hearing music than my brains do. So it's good to, to think of, of that, um, that way of influence if you think about brain and behavior also in, 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 parenting, uh, uh, in the parenting field. One study that gives a uh, give support for this idea is an Israeli study in Ruth Feldman's lab where she observed gay couples and the primary caregiving father's amygdala's activations were quite similar to the primary caregiving mother's. So here we had two fathers but one was primary and responsible for child care and those fathers brains were more similar to the mother's brains than that of the secondary caregiver. And of course that could be some something that they had even before birth, but it could also be the result of more interaction with the infant. And the time spent in direct child care was, for these fathers was related to uh, connectivity between the amygdala and the STS. So it may be more important what fathers do rather than whether they are a father or not. And that's actually what we also found in our study on resting state functional connectivity. There was not a difference between expectant and new fathers. You see them in red for the uh, uh, expectant fathers, in blue for the new fathers, very, very similar. 
but there was an effect of involvement in daily child care for the, for the new fathers. And when they had more involvement in direct child care, there was greater connectivity between the right amygdala and the supramarginal gyrus, the postcentral gyrus, and superior parietal lobule. So, it doesn't matter what you are, it does matter what you do. And that's perhaps a lesson for all of us, for all of us for our whole life, but also for parents. Thank you. And I want to thank my team, and in particular Marinus van Eisenhorn, who was involved in most of the studies that I reported today. And there's time for questions. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really a, an amazing conference, I have to say. Um, so it's time for questions. If you have any doubt, question, you can do it in Portuguese and I'll translate it. No problem whatsoever. Any clarification, if you want to do it in English or... Okay. Espera aí, que eu vou ir ao que aqui. Espera aí, espera aí, espera aí. Espera aí. Estou um bocado lenta. Espera aí, espera aí. Espera aí. So, my question was, is it possible to say that uh, through the mother's unresolved attachment, uh, that they are not able to uh, control their emotions and therefore that they are they use more excessive force? Is there a connection between that or not? Uh, the question is, mothers who are unresolved, um, can they not deal with their emotions? Exactly. And is that a reason that they use excessive force? Exactly. Yeah, that could very well be the case. And emotion regulation is something that is difficult to, to measure. Okay. And I think one of the things that we can do as an indicator of emotion regulation are these physiological measures. Okay. Our heart rates, pre-ejection periods, skin conductance, uh, stress hormones. And what we see then is often that they are hyper, they, they are a bit high anyway, and they don't respond anymore to, to infant mm -hmm. cry sounds, mm -hmm. whereas they do feel irritated. I think with, um, with your emotion regulation in response to infant signals, the optimum is somewhere in the middle. You should, you should take some action, but you should not be overwhelmed by the, by the infant signals. So the optimum is in the middle. And um, mothers with traumatic experience tend to, tend to be on either one side or the other side. Okay, thank you. Vai já, Catarina. There are quite some questions over there. Estava de costas, peço desculpa. Uh, so I wanted to ask something. Uh, my uh, group in biology recently uh, presented um, a resume about an article that uh, stated that we could predict how mothers would act towards their children by um, measuring their pro progest progesterone and estradiol levels uh, up until one year postpartum, and that we could tell, like, uh, if, if there was a relation between them and if we could predict the behavior they would have. And I have a question if we, if that is possible to do the same with fathers, but in this case there would be um, like three hormones because testosterone can turn into estradiol. So it would be testosterone, estradiol, and probably uh, oxytocin or cortisol. Uh, I am going to ask if it is possible to predict their behavior um, from those hormones from prepartum up until one year postpartum? Yeah, I love your question. <laughs> Prediction of fathering from hormones. That's exactly the study that's, uh, that we're currently doing. We have sampled um, um, oxytocin, testosterone, vasopressin, um, estradiol, and what was this fifth? I did show it. Vasopressin? Yeah, and prenatally and then postnatally and up to seven months. So it does not go as far as, uh, as one year of age, but we hope to be able to, to do some prediction. Um, at the same time, 
I do have this little voice in my mind that tells me, is it predicting in a causality sense or is it just a correlation? There may be some basal differences between fathers, which may have to do with their own childhood experiences, that predicts both the way they parent and their hormonal levels. So it's predictive in a technical sense, yes. In a causal sense, I'm not sure. That's not possible to demonstrate with this design. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Badage, no, no, no. Hi again, thank you very much for your communication. Um, and my question is um, about the biological processes underlying parenting. I mean, do you think, based on your research, that there are biological processes underlying sensitive parenting, and for some reason, maltreated mothers uh, can't uh, be so sensitive, uh, or they are um, people when parenting are simply repeating, kind of repeating their attachment histories with their own parents. Yeah. I do think that, that biological uh, processes can underlie parenting, and I think that's most evident from our study uh, with maltreated, uh, maltreating and non-maltreating mothers and then maltreat, who are maltreated themselves, where we see that the response to infant crying is dysregulated, so they are uh, understimulated or overwhelmed by such uh, such sounds, that means that their physiological processes are dysregulated, uh, which makes it much more difficult for them to respond in a balanced, prompt and adequate way. And they need therapy to, to really go through that whole process uh, of perhaps biofeedback, where they realize how they respond as they respond because of their past. So I do think that there are biological processes that play a role in that. So far we've been, um, it has been very difficult to really show a mediating model where there was abuse and then dysregulated physiology and then perpetrated abuse. It has been difficult to find those models every now and then but often not replicated. Um, which I think leaves also room for the more optimistic picture that you can overcome your past and um, it need not be repeated the behavior that you experience from your own parents and you can work it through which may also affect your physiology. So I think yes in the extremes um, your past may influence your physiology, making it much harder to be a sensitive parent. For the, uh, the non-extremes, I think the more you do with the child, the better your physiology adapts to being a parent and to, to sensitive parenting. I'm sorry again, but I I, I got curious. Um, is there a difference between um, biological parents, but basically like the parents? are the ones who are responsible for the child and gay parents or parents who have to adopt. Is there a difference uh, in their physiology, in their brains, in their hormones uh, that happens um, because of like because of like either adopting or the child is not exactly theirs or the child is theirs? Is there a difference between that? Good question. Uh, well, for mothers, we know that the, the oxytocin boost is only present if you give birth, actually even only for vaginal birth. 
for caesarean, uh, there's no increase in oxytocin. And in one study, there's there, uh, one study, I know one study that has found a difference in early interaction between the mother and the baby uh, that was less sensitive after caesarean than after vaginal birth. Um, but I could other reasons play a role in that as well. For, so we know that adoptive mothers will miss, will lack this oxytocin boost, but fathers will, so, will, will miss them too. In, in a way, uh, fathers are a sort of adoptive parents anyway, I sometimes say. <laughs> <laughs> For they don't go through the birth experience. Well, that's not exactly true. I should tell you the story about cortisol. When women give birth, their cortisol increases so much, it is about six to tenfold their normal levels. You'll never have such a high cortisol in your life, level in your life again. But fathers do the same. At least they increase two to fourfold. So apparently, when your partner gives birth, that is also something that is stressful. So yes, they do go a bit through that, and adoptive parents don't do. But Exactly, I would say, because we see so much uh, responding of the brain and physiology to interaction with your baby, the brain, the testosterone levels, the oxytocin levels, I, my guess would be that in the end, after a year, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much again for your um, conference and uh, thank you to all of you making the question. I was just thinking about this last question that the difference is also the time that you make the the data collection and you interpret the data because normally normally you find differences um, a short term but at long term you don't find any difference you know there's a probably a study from the 70s that showed that uh, mothers that did the cesarean were less sensitive in the in the immediate um, interaction but when you measure the then three or seven months after, there were no longer differences. So, and what's important for development is the long-term experience, not the short-term. And um, we did some um, studies with adopted children uh, using the QSORTS, and we didn't find any difference between uh, mothers that were adopted mothers and uh, biological mothers and the quality of attachment when the children were three years old. And that's so, in general so. Yeah. So more decisive for the attachment of adopted children is their pre-adoption history. Exactly. When they've been in institutions for a long time, that's very detrimental. Yeah. But especially when they are adopted at a young age, they are as secure as other children are. Okay. So thank you. Uh, anyway, is there no, no more question? Again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to see all of you here. Prazer vê-los outra vez ao Vivi Acorde. Muito obrigada pela vossa presença. Thank you very much, Marian, for your inspiring conference. And uh, I hope that we can repeat soon. <laughs> thank you. Obrigada. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.